So with that, I would like to welcome Richard Cook. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for the amazing presentation. Thank you very much for having me. And I absolutely love the tie, by the way. Um, thank you. It's it's from my days in pediatrics. Um, you know, if you wear long ties, the, the uh, two-year-olds can get a hold of them, but bow ties they can't get. <laughs> so let's jump right in into our questions. So the first question uh, was kind of regarding, so first of all, we love the metaphor of the bone is not a metaphor for resilience. It's actually the archetype of resilience. It, it's really good to sort of keep ourselves true to what is actually happening in the world. Um, so if, if resilience is something that happens all the time, then how can we test the organism or the organization for the presence of that resilience? Right? We don't want to break bones on purpose. So how can we see what the resilience process currently is? Sure. Um, for, for, let, me, let me begin, first of all, by thanking you very much for the chance to, to come and be with people. And thanks to all the people who've, who've uh, in, interacted in Discord, which I've enjoyed a lot. Uh, and also thanks to many of the many people behind the scenes who've done all this work, because there's lots and lots of folks who are involved in doing this. And uh, believe me, this is as big a production as any real, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, 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 meeting. In fact, probably more so than a face-to-face -face meeting <laughs> because of all the upfront work that's required. And it, I just, I, I think it's quite remarkable. And I'm very pleased to, to have been a part of it uh, uh, here in Chicago. Um, I think resilience is always present and it's always functional. Uh, it's, it's what keeps the world stitched together and makes it go. And you can sort of see that in the bone example by what happens if you don't have that natural resilience. It looks like disease. You have osteogenesis imperfect or it wears out at the end. You have osteoporosis and so on. And, and those disease states are, are ones that we sometimes see in our work um, and then you'll sometimes see in tech, but mostly what you see is resilience because people are very active trying to move things around, make adjustments and so forth to, to keep the systems going. And so I would say that you are you live in a resilient world where resilience plays an important part, but a bit like the bone, which grows and, and that resilience is, is in such balance and contain, keeps the skeleton sort of stable for such a long time, we don't really know that it's ongoing. We don't feel as though our skeleton is being torn apart and rebuilt continuously every 10 years, but that's what's happening. And the same thing is true about these large technical systems. They're being torn apart and rebuilt continuously over shorter periods of time. But because this process is in balance, it produces the impression of this thing as being kind of a stable, uh, uh, a smooth sort of operation. And it's, it's anything but. It's very active, as anyone who's been inside that will be able to tell you. I think we see the resilience play out, and we see it people um, you know, dealing with breakages and rebuilding the system and doing all those different things. But, but we rarely pay attention to that because the overall result is you know, I've got this body, it's got about the same shape it had yesterday, and <laughs> let's keep going. I think that's, yeah, it goes back to like continually thinking about that it's about expressing resilience, right? It's not creating it. It's like, it's a, like you said, it's constantly there, but it's how do we see it? How do we encourage it maybe? Or how do we allow it to express itself, right? Is it, uh, maybe. So there are definitely things that can, can, either enhance or erode resilience. And, and you've seen some of them in your own experience. You've seen circumstances where the team gets really uh, uh, in an unstable state. It's, you know, you've lost a bunch of people who are critical. You've got, you haven't been able to get all the new people into their roles yet. You have this sense of being sort of on the edge of, of a potentially big problem that you really don't want to experience at that moment. Um, this, these are, you're dealing with resilience during that period of time. You're trying to add and, and enhance the resilience. You're also trying to be able to use the resilience in, in ways that allow you to, to accomplish what you need to accomplish. But I think that the key thing here is that that's a natural process. We are the beneficiaries of it. We get the benefits of resilience but we rarely pay much attention to what's going on behind the scenes. And so we can, without knowing it, erode it very badly or fail to invest in it, haven't done much to sustain it, essentially the equivalent of poor nutrition or lack of exercise, if you will. 
and we can end up having building systems that have lost much of the resilience that is needed to deal with the kinds of events that are going to happen in the future. And that's what we all are concerned about. So one of the biggest takeaways from the talk is that resilience and reliability are not the, the same thing, right? And we do often confuse them in the industry. And a lot of times when we talk about increasing resilience, we actually mean increasing reliability. Um, now, in terms of like that second mechanism, right, the increasing the signal and actually affecting resilience, how can we do this in our organizations and our systems? Yeah, it's probably the case that it requires us to understand resilience at a much, much deeper and more fundamental level in the same way that um, we had that first kind of resilience engineering, which involves, you know, reduction and fixation for thousands of years. But we've only found out about the second kind here in about the past decade. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're we're clearly in tech and, and in much of organizational stuff in, in the first 1500 years, not the last 10 for the most part. I think you do it in, in a variety of ways, though. Uh, and much of this has to do with trying to pay attention to what you think the sources of resilience are actually going to be. And I would think that, that the kinds of care that you take with bringing people into the organization, your attempts to keep people working together, to build some structures in which people can move and, uh, and, and adjust to help other people share the adaptive capacity that they have. I think these are all techniques that, that are involved in making the resilience work. There's this paper that, that uh, Beth Long from New Relic and I have coming out uh, in November, uh, which is about this and tries to talk about how people are trying to, to do resilience engineering in the real world. And I think it's a good example. And I'll wait for the paper to come out and you can take a look at it. But basically the idea is that, that there are people who are doing this and not always because they start out with the, mi in the mindset saying, we're going to increase resilience. They're just dealing with problems in the way that they think of dealing with problems. And it turns out that what they're dealing with is actually trying to enhance and, and uh, increase resilience. I think that goes back to when we talk about that, not like to kind of, you know, we'll gather about what resilience is, but oftentimes, you know, we talk about incident prevention, right? Like, and and that that the number of incidents is as a metric that is influencing you know or revealing how resilient your organization is which to me in a way number one it's really it's not right because the resilience is how you rebound it's like in fact how how could you know if you're resilient if you have no incidents at all right you know so what are, but can we expand a little bit on that where we're saying that 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 incident avoidance is not a way to understand whether or not your organization is resilient so, so kind of what is the metric that we want to apply here, right? Yes. Um, I, I think this is um, pretty poorly aligned for metrics, at least at the current stage of understanding. Mm -hmm. but, but let me put, put you, t tell you why I think this is, is difficult. People use the word resilience. It's become a popular term. So it's used a lot in a <laughs> lot of places. And, and in many cases, it's just, you know, essentially reliability plus or reliability plus plus. It's, it's an increment, a slightly long, slightly stronger version, that sort of thing. If you look at the people who, at the work of folks like Dave Woods and other people who've done real basic work on resilience and what it is, they would say that resilience is, is not really about rebound or just the ability to return back to where we were before the event happened, but it's about being able to make adaptations in order to be able to, to change the way the system is functioning so that it can handle these new kinds of situations. And I, I think you might find an example for many people in the ways that you've had to adapt to COVID. COVID was unexpected. We didn't, nobody really thought we were going to have to all work from home starting at the end of January. Most people didn't have any appreciation for what the disruption was going to look like in an economic sense or in a business sense. But certainly many of the big uh, providers of services, especially in the cloud, did not prepare very well for, for all these things because they couldn't anticipate them. And yet, what we saw over a very short period of time is a huge amount of adaptation taking place that allowed us to resume or in many cases continue those functions more or less uninterrupted. 
you guys had a, a pretty good head start on that since you're already doing a lot of work remotely. So for you, it was a kind of an extension, but it was still a big extension. That was a big change, right? But it actually, it was made, that's an adaptation. And that's a kind of resilience. When you have to adapt what you are doing to achieve these other goals, that's real big capital R resilience in the biggest way. And you're doing it. You're, we see it. This is, a, this is in some ways an ideal test case for us. What's happened in the response to COVID is a clear demonstration of sustaining adaptive capacities so that people and organizations, structures and systems can adapt to deal with this new set of circumstances. Now, the key thing in, in Wood's notion here is that fourth sense is, is it, can, can it be sustained? Are we in a position now where the next shock that happens, we will be able to adapt again? Or have we consumed all of our resilience in adapting to this one shock? How much are we investing at this moment in being able to weather the next storm, the next disruption, the next difficulty we have? And that would be that sustained adaptability that Woods is talking about as the, as the sort of high end sense of resilience. I think a lot of people are actually thinking about this. There's a lot of, when I talk to leaders and, and a lot of workers, they're thinking about how do we get ourselves in a position where we can deal with what the next problem is, whether that's a, a major weather event, or some, some sort of political disturbance, whatever is going to happen, we're going to have to adapt again. This isn't the last time we're going to need to, to draw on resilience to adapt. And so investing in that adaptive capacity going forward is a really key idea. I think that's that's interesting to me too because I look at it and the cynic in me says like so we did this, but then when everything settles, you know my concern is that leadership goes back to that we go back to like okay but that was a thing that happened, and we can continue to work the same way like that not seeing it as this opportunity to actually like you said that our world right now that everything that's happening is an amazing use case to teach everybody about resilience and resi right you know but are we going to learn from that? Or what do you are, think, we, did we get lucky? <laughs> what do you think DevOps days is? <laughs> well, I hope we're learning from it. <laughs> I mean, this is it. Yeah. Right? This is, this is it. Right here. Yeah. This, <laughs> this thing is about that. And that's what, if you look at the list of talks and the discussions and the, the breakouts, it's all about adapting and how to adapt. You're doing it. This is what it, this is what it takes. So it, it's an interesting analogy between software and hardware. Like hardware is something that is relatively static and hard to change, whereas software is something that's relatively easy to adapt. And and this is kind of like DevOps is our software here in, in, in this industry, right? That, that learning experience that we can apply from today to tomorrow to gain some um, more resilience. So, someone's going to interpret this as Sasha said, you can't DevOps on bare metal and we're going to have a whole Twitter <laughs> fight now. But that's, uh, that's I, I don't, one. you know, I, I think it turns out that, that if, if you look at the history, particularly of the 1950s and 1960s, you would say, turns out that software is actually very hard to mm -hmm, adapt, mm -hmm. very hard to modify, very hard to keep going. And it's a, that's been one of the great realizations is that it's not this, you know, t entirely plastic thing that just we make it up however we want it. There's big commitments here and we're still, you know, the, the persistence of the bass shell is, should tell you that there's <laughs> something really fundamental about changing under things that are underneath the hood. But uh, let me show you that picture of yeah. the tree. Can we call up the tree? If you look at the picture of the tree, what you see is that there's this living organism that has adapted to the circumstances in which it finds itself confronting this kind of rigid stru structure, right? That's what we're talking about. Is it pretty? Maybe not. It's not the way you'd want things to be. Is it effective? Does it allow the tree to grow? Yes. And so, so we're, this is, I think, the, the, the lesson. Adaptation doesn't mean that we get always what we want or that the systems behave the way that we want to. Uh, but it does mean that we're busy trying to make these things work. And, and those combined efforts across a whole group of people, many of whom are in the audience and, and participating today, is what actually uh, makes this possible. It's DevOps that makes it possible to continuously adapt and to sustain that adaptability. And that's why it's so good to be with you today. So another question I would like to ask, and we're learning from biology here a lot in terms of observation, right? Par parallels and metaphors, but 
Um, can we learn from biology in terms of how to apply this? Like how to get better at systems engineering and, yeah. I think the first observation would be that, that it, uh, you can study a lot about resilience and learn a great deal without understanding the molecular biology of osteoclasts and osteoblasts, right? Orthopedic surgery, which is a very well-developed, very advanced field, knew almost nothing about the molecular basis of these things until quite recently. And yet orthopedic surgery has been effective since at least 1500 BC or before. So you can do a lot by observing the patterns that resilience, how resilience plays out and building the engineering of your organizations to take advantage of that. And I would encourage you to do that. I would also encourage you to think about the kinds of things that are likely to help. Remember that if you, if you break a bone and then starve the organism for, for nutrition, the bone will heal very poorly and very slowly. And you might not think immediately, oh, there's this connection between nutrition and bone strength, but there is, and it's a really important one. And so if you watch for those connections, you'll be able to see them. And I think in some of your organizations, some of your experience will tell you that there are places where there's lots of nutrition and good feeding going on that helps that resilience play out in a very effective way. I think, yeah, when we think about how to how to observe this, and that, that might be kind of the thing when we, when we want just in practice, if we want to get better at this, what we're getting better at, we have to start by, by observing it, by understanding the resilience of an organization, especially when you think about um, someone who is an individual contributor, someone who's, you know, getting shit done, you know, kind of thing. Like, what are, what are some of those tactical things we can do to see where this is happening? Um, because it helps us feel better about it, right? It helps us understand that good things are happening uh, or they exist that we might not see because we're used to measuring it by the number of seven ones, right? Yeah, I, th I think that clearly measuring things by the number of seven right. ones doesn't draw attention to much about resilience. And so you can do that. You might have to do that for a variety of reasons, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, that's, not a, that's not going to lead to much better understanding of resilience. But here's a different kind of kind of view. You're, if you start from the from the position that resilience is present and functional and that your systems are working because of that, then the task for you is to uncover those mechanisms and understand them better. Not to go out and make them scratch from scratch, but to rather, rather understand how they play out. And that seems to me to be the next challenge in front of us, is that we have to understand more about how this resilience actually works to make things happen, how it allows us to be prepared to adapt to something like this COVID crisis that we've had and how it, we could enhance the, the qualities of the system that we end up with by being aware of that and, and doing what is effectively the same thing as open reduction and external fix or internal fixation. What does it mean to put a cast on the organization after it's had a break so that it can heal in, in, a, in a functional way? Again, these are these these don't. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's a little hard to to do the metaphor, but but what I hope that happens is that as you go through your daily work and you see something that looks like resilience, and you say, "Is that resilience?" You think back to the bone example, and I think that will help you see more clearly into the systems that you're working with and have an appreciation for that. The dynamic balance constantly being destroyed and created along the lines of stress. That for me is a very powerful image and I've been captivated by that for many years. So I think I love that we are having this conversation because I think like even after watching your talk, I've learned a lot just from us just having this dialogue right now. Um, and one of the biggest things is just learning through observation, right? It, like <clears throat> the resilience is already there. How can we learn what it is and, and help it manifest itself? Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And also thank you for, uh, thank you to OSPA for answering yeah. some of the questions on Discord. Um, Believe it or not, so John, John has been doing more <laughs> in Discord than just trolling Dr. Cookies actually. <laughs> Yes. been helping out and being productive and i i can only imagine that maybe only half of his responses were links to pdfs and so so speaking of links to pdfs i think <laughs> we should share some more resources for folks who want to explore the topics and of course the recording is going to be available so um thank you so much for being with us today yeah thanks so much it's a privilege to be with you it's an honor to be able to talk with people you guys your folks are now where it's at 
okay? You're the ones who are doing it. And, and the resilience that exists in organizations in these companies is represented by the people who are on this discord right now. And, and you're an incredibly valuable resource. And, and I want you to know that those of us who study resilience are turning to your field and looking at it in order to better understand resilience. We get our ideas from biology and other places, but frankly, we're watching you very closely because we're learning so much from what you are doing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you.